Hello and welcome to the Two Man Power Trip of Wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Paz. With me today, very special guest. He is, of course, a former IWF superstar and a former WWF superstar. He is known as Big Ron. Of course, he is Mr. Ron Shaw. Ron, welcome to the Two Man Power Trip. How you doing? Doing good, John. I hope it's a uh, great evening there in, I believe, it's Asbury Park, New Jersey, as yes. it is here in Fort Myers, Florida. It's a beautiful 73 degrees right now. Wow, nice. It's, uh, yeah. I think, 33 here, so <laughs> it's not great. You, you, you can have it. Yeah, oh, man. It, it, some of these Decembers, oof, they're rough. Or, you know, these winter months oh, are rough. Uh, John, I, believe me, you know, I, I lived in Philadelphia. I was born in Philadelphia, and I, I know all about those winters, and there's just so much of that you can take. So what is going on in your world? What have you been up to lately? Anything wrestling? Uh, absolutely nothing, uh, uh, wrestling, uh, you know, I retired from the business in 1999. Um, but I've been doing a lot of shows, including your podcast tonight. Uh, didn't really think I was going to want to do this podcast, uh, because of the last show I was on. And, uh, I don't know if you <laughs> heard anything about it or, or knew of it and so forth, but it was, I, I was kind of saying, well, you know, I, I just don't think I want to do this anymore. And even prior to doing that show. I wasn't too sure I wanted to do any more because I was on with a gentleman from England, the WSI guy. I don't know if I can mention people's names. Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, James Romero, wrestling mm -hmm. shoot interviews. And I said after that, I you know I thought it would be the last one I would do. But uh, the Monty and the Pharaoh guy called me and uh, said, Ron, hey, we'd like to have you on the show. I said, you know, well, you know, Monty, I said, I, I'm. I don't think I'm up for doing these shows anymore. I said, you know, the guy was a little guy in this business, you know what I mean? And, you know, he, he was nice enough to build me up just like you did, a superstar. I didn't, never considered myself a superstar, but, but thank you anyway. And, uh, you know, I said, uh, all right, let me think about it. So I called him up a couple of weeks later. And, uh, you know, I wanted to start feeling people out because, you know, the conversation has been pretty much the same thing over and over again. And, uh, you know, he says, well, here's what I want to talk about. He wanted to talk about things that I didn't want to even touch, you know, the ring boy scandal, uh, uh, this and that. And plus the big upset of professional wrestling. Okay. That I'm known for today. And, uh, he was being, being very persistent. I thought a little bit, uh, uh, arrogant about it. And I, I said, you know what? I said, I don't need this money. And I hung up on him. Well, it was about three, four days later, his, uh, his partner, uh, the Pharaoh called up. And he said, Ryan, look, he goes, we worked, we worked everything out. You know, we'll, we'll, we want you on the show. I said, OK, fine. But, you know, it, it stuck in the back of my mind. And, uh, you know, I said, I, I have a feeling that this guy's going to go where he wants to go. And, and that's pretty much it. Well, that's how the show pretty much started off. I said, I, I probably was a little bit more arrogant at the start of the show. And I just wanted to speak my piece and just see where it was going to go. But he was being disrespectful to me, John. And, and, and you know, it, this was something that was new to me because everybody's really treated me really nice on their shows. You know, I've been I've been on a lot of podcasts. This is my this is now my 16th show since I started my uh, my website in 2015. And uh, it was it was not even five minutes into the show uh, that he was saying, well, you know, you have to show me respect on my show. And the Pharaoh had to jump in and say, hey, it's our show. To give you an idea of, you know, the disrespect that not he only showed me, he was showing his his partner on the show, you know. And let me tell you something. He has an ego. Um, you know, he's had he's had wrestlers, guests on his show, pop him in the teeth on the show. And I, and I don't know why that's happening that way. OK, you know, this guy probably goes around these wrestling conventions, John, in his Jimmy Durante hat and his Ray Charles sunglasses just looking to get noticed. Okay. But if you take that hat off of this guy and those sunglasses off of this guy, he's a, just a punk. Okay. He's just a punk. And I don't respect the guy. And I don't care if he respects me or not. I personally don't care, but that's what I was going through. But you know, when you invited me on your show, I went on the internet and I said, wow. I said, man, you got a lot of big names, a lot of big names on that show. And I said, I need to be a part of it for that hour or whatever it's going to be and so forth. But, you know, just, just get back to one more time because I don't want to, I don't want to elaborate on this too much, but let me tell you something. He said, never again, will I have Ron Shaw on my show. He just doesn't want to be in the same building 
and work with Ron. So he doesn't want to invite me to his show live in the studio. And that's, that's perfectly fine. But let me tell you something, John. If I ever came out of retirement, which I'm not, I'd love to be in the ring with this guy. I'd love to be in the ring with this guy. See if he would get smart with me in the ring. Mm, interesting fellow. I don't know him, but interesting fellow. <laughs> mm -hmm. For sure. yep. Weird way to conduct interviews with uh, you know famous wrestlers from the past. It's just a weird way to go about it. But hey, I mean, whatever works for him, I get, or doesn't work for him. What you know, whatever. I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. So with you, I know we wanted to talk. We were talking about it off air a while back when we were talking about IWF and kind of getting started there. Who was the actual like owner and promoter? Was that Killer Kowalski's like baby? Was that his promotion? That was yes, that was his promotion. Um, when uh, when they ended the executioner thing, him and him and John Studd, or it was Chuck O'Connor, I guess at the time, under the masks, and uh, uh, Waller retired. He started that up, and uh, it was going it was going to be strictly in the New England area, and uh, he got TV right away. It was, it was great TV that was called Boston, uh, Bedlam from Boston, and it was run on a Sunday morning, and it was the number one show in that time slot every Sunday evening. And I went to work for Walter for uh, two years, but we, we merged very soon with Bruno San Martino out there in Allentown. So we were doing the TV shifted over into Allentown where we uh, were doing that. But yeah, Walter was, uh, the, he started the IWF. Yeah. Was he your, basically how you broke in? He was your trainer. He was your guy. Walter. Yeah. Walter was the only guy to train me. It was uh, 16 weeks I think it was in a, in a gym, a, a Salem YMCA in Massachusetts. Um, it was, it was great training. I, I, I was amazed that I was able to get a hold of Walter to train me and so forth. Uh, and we met up there one day, I took a ride up there one day and, uh, he was, he was showing me how it's kind of what the business is somewhat about without actually saying anything about it. And I already knew you know, what it was like. Uh, but, you know, one thing about Waller is he taught he taught you how to uh, even shoot if you had to. Um, this was really, really good training. I mean, really great training. And Waller, Waller was a natural at this business, you know, main eventer for his 30 years, you know. But, uh, yeah, Waller was the guy. Had you actually, like, get into the business and connect with him to begin with? Like, do, Were you just a fan and you knew you wanted to do this and somehow got in touch with him? I was, yeah, well, I was eight years old when I was introduced to this business. Uh, my, my cousin took me down to the dressing room in Camden, New Jersey, it was, to watch the pro wrestling matches. Took me down to the dressing room, and, uh, and my eyes lit up. You know, when you're a little kid, uh, you know, these things are big on your mind for a while, you know. And right, right from the start, I, I knew that's what I wanted to be. And, you know, a funny story uh, happened i said you know we used to go down to philadelphia arena me and a buddy of mine and uh, watch the tv tapings and they also ran that uh, the one house show there once a month and i went into the uh ticket office box it was a phil zatko promoter i don't know if that name rings a bell oh yeah okay yeah. and uh, you know he was counting the receipts the end of the night and i told my buddy i said you know what i got an intermission i'm gonna go run and talk to phil zatko see if i can see if there's a wrestling school around well, I went into there, knocked on the door, went into there, and I said, uh, Mr. Zacco, I said, I'm very interested in getting into pro wrestling. And at that time, you know, me being six foot three, I, this, this was already, I was in probably 11th grade, okay, in high school. And I said, uh, uh, you know, I was probably 240 pounds then. And uh, he looked at me, he says, uh, yeah, yeah. He says, I can give you a school uh, in Reading. I guess he meant Reading, Pennsylvania. I wasn't too sure. And he started to write it down. And I, I said, you know, I said, you know, Mr. Zacco, I said, I know there's a lot of show business involved with this, you know, and trying to let him know that I knew something about it, you know, and that was the work. Maybe, maybe it was a good thing that happened because he threw me out of the, <laughs> threw me out of the box office for saying, you know, these guys are getting hurt every night and you're telling me there's a lot of show business in this type of, right. And he threw me out. He threw me out. And I said, maybe that was a good thing, you know, and that was the only first time that I pursued a wrestling school until I saw Walter's school on a, uh, um, it was a weekly evening magazine, half hour magazine about his school. And, and, uh, uh I, I actually called up our Philadelphia station and they gave me his phone number and I called him, talked to him and that's, that was it. 
that's how I that's how I got a hold of Wolver. When you are breaking in, like you said, you were a fan, you were interested. Did you know? Like you know, you knew the show business. Did you know like everything? Like basically the the kayfabe world of wrestling. Were you aware? Yeah, I, I think I was because I I watched it so much. I would go I would go to the matches even occasionally with my cousin and and I'm almost calling the high, high spots before they did them. He's amazed of you know what I'm telling him and so forth. And uh, I mean you know you, you can tell pulled punches and and everything like that. I mean I mean I was very smart. It was like it was like since. Eight years old, I was already training, but in my mind, understanding what it was. And I guess that's why Vince McMahon Sr. called me down to the dressing room in early 1981 and said, you know, Ron, he goes, you're a natural at this. He goes, are you able to travel? And I said, that was that was such a high, highest compliment that you can give anybody. Did anybody else ever get a compliment like that? You know, I was just a young kid. And that's exactly who I wanted to go for. When I left Walter school, I said, Walter, I said, I want to go to work for the WWF, you know, where – where a lot of guys, under, maybe not understanding it, but sometimes they want to go somewhere else where they can get a name, you know, and then then come to the major promotions and 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 work there. But I said, you know, something. I said, if I want to go there. That's where the that's where the top money is in the country, and uh, it worked out. It it didn't take me long before they were booking me regularly at the end of 1980 and 1981. I made an awful lot of money in 1981 because I was working as the executioner. I was working as Ron Shaw and sometimes twice in the same, in the same show, you know, doing double, double uh, house shows in like Boston or not Boston, but the Washington cap center in Baltimore, which are only 45 miles apart from each other. That's in the same, the same day, you know, I made a lot of money. So I, I did the right thing. Apparently. So two paychecks, huh? If you wrestle twice, you're not just getting one check. You're getting two. You're, you're getting paid twice. Yeah. Exactly. When Kowalski is training you, does he tell you he can get you into WBF? Is it just known he can get you into WBF? Like, what's like the kind of protocol? Or do you you say, hey, get me in WBF? Like you were saying, like you wanted to work there. Well, I, I think um, since he was already running his own promotion, um, he wasn't exactly, you know, if anybody went up to him and asked him to go work somewhere, as I imagine that may have happened. I, I, I don't know. You know, it seemed, it seemed like a lot of the guys, when I left there, uh, I know one guy, John Callahan, who now uh, does a Sergeant Muldoon gimmick as a manager and so forth. I mean, he did a lot of work in the WWF, mainly in the New England area. He'd come to TV tapings, too, and so forth. Uh, but they were doing a lot of their own IWF shows. And then, I guess, you know, later on, um, well, many, many years after I left there, I guess, you know, he was training some of the other big names who went on to the WWE and uh, you know, but, but at that point, that was the only promotion around pretty much, you know, but, uh, I, I knew right off the, right off the start where I wanted to go work. And I said, you know, I can understand, you know, probably how I'm going to be used, you know, and, uh, fortunately they used me as a heel, uh, which is a good thing. Cause then you're a baby face and you're just getting knocked around all the time and you just get a, you know, a bad reputation. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's pretty much the way it is, you know? So when you first get in and you're starting with WBF, is it Allentown, PA? Or are you starting to do the, the TV tapings? Is that how you kind of break in on, on TV or were you doing house shows and stuff? No, uh, no, right off the start. Well, Gorilla Monsoon gave me a call two weeks after I was, I, I left Walter school and he says, uh, he says, uh, Walter, Walter talked to me. He says, you, you know, you want to do TV? And I said, yeah. He said, come on up to Allentown. So I did Allentown and, uh, my first match there was against uh, Tony Atlas. Okay, very first match, and uh, I can't. He told me to come back again several several other times because it was every three weeks they did the tapings, and then he told me to come to uh, Hamburg, which was All Star Wrestling, and then I started showing up in little spot shows around Philadelphia. They ran a lot of shows in Jersey, South Jersey, and it was just a forty five minute drive. And I'd go there many times, and and Monsoon was the agent. And he would say, Ron, you got your stuff? I said, yeah, get dressed. You know, because they were short somebody or they wanted to put on another, another match. I don't know. So there was many times I, I actually worked. Then they started booking me. And uh, the last three months of 1980, I was getting three to four shows a week, which was pretty darn good. You know, so, you know, and plus, plus it helped, John. You know, I was six foot three. I, I was 
probably the biggest, tallest guy there. You know, when I first started out, my weight was low because I lost a lot of weight living in Salem, Massachusetts for a while, you know, and I was just starting to get my weight back up and, and training, lifting, getting bulkier. I, I may have been 230 pounds when I first started doing TV there, but the weight came back to one where I was maybe 260. I, I, I did touch 270 at a few times, but being six foot three, um, you know, get one of these little guys and, and, and they're beating this big guy like that. And it, you know, it looks, it looks a lot better. See, so that's why they, they kept me as a heel pretty much. I didn't maybe look like a heel, but I was. So it worked out what, well. What did you think of Gorilla Monsoon? You are mentioning that he's kind of the agent and stuff. What do you think about big old Gorilla? Gorilla was a nice guy. Oh, such a such a great guy. Always giving me help. You know, he, he gave me he gave me a pair of his boots when they when I started doing the executioner uh, gimmick and uh, gave me a pair of his old black boots. And uh, they were they were kind of short at the ankle, and I had to take them to a, a a shoe place to add an additional five six inches onto it to make it a higher boot, you know. But Gorilla Monsoon was a very nice guy, great guy, easy to get along with. Oh, very easy, very easy. Yeah, you could talk to him anytime, and and then, you know he'll 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 listen to you, and and uh, very important, very important to the business. What did you think about Vince Sr., Vince McMahon Sr.? Great guy. Uh, you know, this this is a guy who took me down to the dressing room and told me, Ron, he goes, you're a natural at this. He was a gentleman. I mean, you know, he he conducted himself like a true businessman, you know, walked around in a nice suit and uh, just just was so calm, relaxed. And, and uh, you know, I, I there was a story one time I, I had wrestled in um, Norwalk, Connecticut, I believe it was. And it, it was a uh, it was a spot show, and uh, you know they would give you an advance at the time, sometimes fifty or a hundred dollars, you know. And I think that show that show paid three hundred dollars. And some of these things I can remember, some of the things I can't, you know. But but this particular show, and I'm I'm wondering how come I didn't get paid for the rest of this show, you know? So one day I decided to go in there. I I knocked on the office door, and and Mr. McMahon, you know, senior, he said, "Yeah, come on in, Ron." I said, you know, sir, and I always called him sir or Mr. McMahon. I said, you know, I didn't get paid for Norwalk, Connecticut. He goes, okay. And he checked his briefcase. I guess he went to see what the payout was for that and, and gave me $250 right there on the spot. You know, didn't, never had to beg, plead or anything. <laughs> but, that, but, you know, it's not just that. The guy was a gentleman. I mean, there's nobody in this business can say anything bad about him. Was it a mistake that you didn't get paid? That was just a uh, yeah. It was a mistake. Yeah, yeah. It was it was a mistake. I can't I can't clearly say if at the time because we used to get paid cash. Okay, when you went to the TV, they finally uh, uh, give you the rest of the money from the past two or three weeks sometimes, uh, and then it went on to them just sending you checks in the mail. So I can't you know I can't remember was it was a check. Or it was cash at the time. That that part I don't remember, you know. But it was it was an accident. He's a very honest guy, though. It seems. Or what? Tremendously, tremendously honest. Yeah, we're talking about Vince Senior. Yes, tremendously honest. What is the story of him walking around with like quarters all the time? What what was the the thought process behind that? Uh, well, I, I guess it's just like uh, you or I. Sometimes we might have our keys in our pocket, and we're just. Our hands are fine with jingling those keys or, or sometimes what I like to do is I'm walking into a department store. I had the keys in my hand and I got my finger through the, through the key ring and I'm just tossing them around a little bit. So forth. Um, I, I don't know. I didn't think of that as anything abnormal, but yeah, he did that a lot, you know, did that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. It's something the wrestlers always said, like he had the quarters with the, you know, you hear That's the click right. black and the change. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he'd just be, you know, a little bit like this. And then, and then maybe one hand, he's just shaking them around pretty much. And um, I, I don't know what that meant to him to do it, but they, yeah, it was, it was quarter. I guess it was quarters. I had 50 cent piece would have been a little bit too big, but you know, great guy, great guy, amazing guy. Hey, I wonder what the psychology is behind that, or if there is even anything behind it. Like, why? why is it I do not know. Do not know. I'm not into that psychology <laughs> arena. 
very early on when you're there, you end up wrestling Hulk Hogan. Obviously, this is 1980 or so. I mean, this is early Hulk. What did you think about Hulk at that point in his career? Obviously, he'd go on to become the, arguably the biggest star of all time. But what did sure. you think about him in 1980? In 1980, I, I you know, when you first seen this guy, I think, I think, what was he, six, seven? I, I think six, seven. Yes. And I mean, I mean, as big as he was and having, having that type of a body on him and, and, you know, that long blonde hair, I said, I said, man, this guy is huge. And the first time I saw him was in, uh, uh, in Allentown because the dressing room was just one big hallway, just, just covered by, uh, um, what do you want to call it? Cloth, cloth, uh, or canvassing and so forth. So everybody was there to one dressing room. So, you know, you look at everybody and see everybody and they say, you know, this guy, is, this guy is huge, you know? And, 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 you know, I worked with him uh, one time in, in Allentown and uh, uh, but he was, he was a little unsure of himself. I know he had some experience already. I, I imagine, I don't know how many years, maybe a year or two that he had experience. Uh, maybe, you know, that John, I don't, I don't know, but he certainly seemed a little unsure of himself because in our match, uh, he sat me up on the turnbuckle and just walked over and gave me a little smack. And it wasn't a hard smack. It was just a little bit like that, you know, and backed off. And then we went into the finish. And back in the dressing room, he says, you know, he says, I don't know why I, I went for that smack on your face. <laughs> he, just, he just told me that, you know, I, I shrugged my shoulders and I, I, I said, and he thanked me and that was it, you know. So, yeah. Was he like as confident as he, as he should have been at this point. And like, what, what was he like? Cause obviously, you know, he goes on to become, you know, what he become, but at that point, was he quite ready? Because I've talked to guys like Greg Gagne in, in the past. And he was saying like, even when Hulk was in the AWA, ah, he wasn't quite ready yet. Like he was getting there. So in, in, in 1980 is, is, is he as good or, or, or did he need a lot of grooming still? I, I think he still needed grooming. I mean, because, uh, I, they, they didn't have him there that long that I can remember uh, that maybe he was working as a heel in some championship matches and then he went away. And maybe that's, maybe that's where more of the grooming came in or the grooming was taking care of, you know, his, his um, first year or so in the WWF, you know, I don't remember too much. I, like, like you say, other people probably know a little bit more than I do on that. Uh, but he went away, came back and, and that's, that was history. Did you like him as a person? Like, did you guys get along backstage or you didn't really spend too much time with him? Well, you no, know, there were times uh, I, I could talk to him and so forth. He'd he just come up and say, hey, Ron, how you doing? You know, and, and I'm doing good, man. You know, we were just talk a little bit. But, you know, he, he's a busy guy, you know, and, and uh, you know, he'd mainly go around, say hi, and, and then he'd go into his own. He pretty much had a dressing room of his own, you know, or, or he was just maybe away for most of the guys and so forth. But easy guy to talk to if you wanted to. You know, I, I never came across anybody. I mean, I didn't try to talk to a lot of the, uh, the bigger name, you know, the heels, so like uh, um, Macho Man Savage, because you know, he was always in his own dressing room with his, with his wife and so forth. And, and Dr. D. David Schultz, he was his own personality, guys like that. So, you know, the, uh, the talent hung around with certain talent and so forth, you know what I mean? And... Uh, yeah, you know, it just it just it just all depended. But uh, Hulk, Hulk, Hulk was uh, he give you he give you the time of the day, <laughs> you know, if you asked him. So who are your guys? Who are the guys that you're hanging out with uh, behind the scenes? Well, it could have been it could have been anybody because you know, uh, you know, if I'm traveling to a town, there might be there might be uh, Steve Lombardi, Jose Luis Rivera, AJ Petruzzi, and another town it might be up in New England might be Pete Darty. Um, maybe some uh, SD Jones was good, good to hang around with too, you know, uh, traveling because traveling around, I mainly traveled by myself, except in the very beginning. Um, because uh, Tony Altimore, he would drive a lot of the boys around so forth. So, uh, you know, maybe I'd drive up to Connecticut cause we're doing a three or four, uh, city tour up in new England. And, uh, I drove at the time, you know, I'm new to the business. I was driving this little, little stinky car. I forget what the heck it was. Maybe an AMC Gremlin. <laughs> I think it may have been, you know. And Tony trying to get out of uh, uh, driving. He goes, "Hey, hey, Ron." He goes, "You think we can get all four of us in your car?" I said, "I said you probably get all four of us in the car, but the damn car ain't going to move, you know." <laughs> so he'd have to end up driving. Uh, but uh, you, when it got a little bit later, 
1981, I traveled by myself, you know, because I could stop, go, you know, a lot of the guys used to go from the one town all the way to the next town, drive most of the night. I stopped in the middle. So I didn't have to drive, you know. So, you know, I'd get up in the morning, have a nice leisurely breakfast, uh, uh, maybe work out around 11, 12 o'clock in the morning and, and then drive to the show, get a hotel. And that's the way I did it. That's the way I preferred to do it. What do you think just about the territory in total? I know you were saying the money was good. Did you mind how much travel there was? Was there, to, in your mind, a lot of travel involved? Um, I, there could be if they did it in a way that, uh, it, you know, wouldn't work out for me. Like um, if you were going to the TV tapings and you looked, you got your bookings and you would see the first shots in Boston, my second shot might be in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Oh gosh, I got to drive 300 miles up to Boston, come back 300 miles. Then the next day I'm going to Harrisburg. But what they would normally do is when you would do a town, you'd do, let's say, Connecticut. Then you'd go to Providence, then Boston. Okay. Now that was no problem to do. But when I had to go shoot 300 miles and then come back another 300 miles, then go do it. And that happened a lot of times. And there was a lot of times it was, it was really great. It was, was very easy. But a lot of, when they used to do spot shows, tremendous amount of shows in Pennsylvania and, and New Jersey, they were, oh, they were the greatest. You know, I was home every single night, you know. I, I love that. It was that was the best, sure. Because it seems like you know Northeast. Oh, you know the travel might not be that bad, but you to me you're right. It's like New Jersey, Connecticut. Then you go mm-hmm. up to Boston. I mean, I mean they're you know pretty uh pretty long travel days. If if they like you said, if they don't book it right, or if the if the town is you know Boston and and Elizabeth, New Jersey, or something. I mean, it, it can get a little crazy. Right. Yeah. It, it you know as I say, the territory went from uh, from uh, Maine, Vermont. To uh, Pittsburgh, occasionally to go over the line into Virginia, down to Washington D.C., and anywhere is in between, you know. But I, and, and I probably and I worked every house show in the territory, you know, maybe maybe two two three times, and some even more. And I surprised Madison Square Garden as many times as I worked there. In 1981, uh, I worked six times in Madison Square Garden. And that's just after wow. their three or four months of being in the business, you know. But that's what that's what they did is they they put the hood on me, and so you know I'd be working against Dusty Rhodes, Mill Masteris, and then I'd come in as Ron Shaw and uh, um, work with uh, Steve O, uh, S. D. Jones, and and uh, you know a few other of the guys. But at Madison Square Garden, I probably worked uh, the most, along with my hometown, Philadelphia Spectrum, Baltimore, Baltimore Civic Center, yeah pretty awesome what did you think about the mecca the garden like what did you think were you nervous is that like the the home base yeah. to the god of wrestling if you will is that yeah, what, it, well, you know, what it means to a lot of the fans well absolutely you know it's 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 a it's a different you know this, this may sound crazy is that every arena has its own sound it was like the philadelphia arena in in, in uh, uh when i was a kid going down to watch it it was just an echo throughout there was the bell the bell was different from anything else that you heard in any other arena. And that's why I, I would have been such a great thing that wrestled in the Philadelphia arena. And there's a lot of, a lot of good memories from me watching those shows and being there, you know, in person watching those shows. Um, but, but uh, going into Madison square garden, I mean, it's just looking up at the lights, the people. And, and then, and then you see Vince there at the announcer's uh, table, right, right by ringside there. And then, you know, <laughs> there's the nerves start clicking a little bit because Vince is sitting right there, you know? Um, but it, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was different than any other arena that I worked because, you know, they were doing it live. I think it would, they were broadcasting that in, uh, uh, Japan at the time. And so many, so many people from the press all, all the time around the ring. So that was always a big thing for me. Yeah. It is the Mecca. You know, everyone says that's like the goal, the work for, work at the garden. That's right. I mean, if you can get one shot in the garden in your lifetime, that's that's something. It really is something. But I came, I came back all those other years, too. They booked me. So, yeah, great memories. As a matter of fact, I got, I got a couple of those matches on my website. As a matter of fact, everything I'm talking about tonight is on my website. What is the website? Just so we, uh, so we have that. Oh, uh, sure. It's uh, Big Ron Shaw. WWF dot 
Com. Okay, and uh, there's pictures there. There's videos. There's uh, um, latest uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, podcasts and radio shows that I've done in the past, and uh, um, a lot of comments from fans. Um, everything, everything you have, every, everything there. I mean, I mean, let me tell you something. I said, you know, when I did this website in 2015, there's a story behind it, John. And uh, you know, when I retired at the end of 1999, I I totally dropped the business. I got rid of my wrestling gear, except for two sets of boots and my, my hood as the executioner. I kept that. I said, I'll never get back in the ring again. Uh, I, I made, I made a lot of money and I invested it and I made a lot of money while I invested it. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think what happened was if I can remember is that my wife was occasionally going on the internet and uh, people were asking what happened to me. You know, did I die? They haven't heard because a lot of the big names were dying at that time, you know, young at young ages. You know, my, my good yeah. friend, King, King Kong Bundy, you know, Chris, you know, yeah. passing away like that. Uh, Larry Winters. Uh, 2015, I think uh, he passed away as a, in a, uh, from a heart attack, matter of fact. And uh, she says, you know, people people want to know, you know, where are you at? Well, I said, uh, maybe you should get a website. And I did. You know, I, I looked at this as really a pain in the ass to do. You know, I, I got lazy. You know, I just, when, I, when I retired, I went to work for, for a uh, trucking company uh, hauling the U.S. mail. OK, I wasn't working for the post office, but they were contractors for the U.S. mail. So, you know, I, I worked uh, about uh, seven, eight, maybe nine years or so forth. And, and in 2015, we looked at it. And I said, yeah, let's do it. You know, let, let's try it out. And uh, we started putting up some things started growing a little bit. Uh, my hometown newspaper here in Fort Myers, they contacted me. And there's a story on there still to this day that, uh, you know, about the big upset. Everybody wants to know about the big upset, you know. Oh, yeah. And then, <laughs> excuse me. And then it went to um, uh, some radio shows calling me, Philadelphia and, and, and in, in uh, not Pittsburgh, uh, uh, Altoona area, these little shows calling me. And then, and then you guys started calling me, you know, and I said, I said, well, wow. I said, man, this, this really took off. You know, I get a thousand looks a week on average at my website. I don't know if that's a lot. I don't know if that's a little bit or what, but you know, it seems like it's enough to me, <laughs> you know, people are interested. Uh, and I just put up some video about three weeks ago, my hall of fame induction into the IWF. I put that up. I put up a match, which was never seen on YouTube. I still got some stuff that's never been seen on YouTube a match uh, against Andre the Giant from All-Star Wrestling. So I got two matches up there against Andre. And uh, I got some other executioner ones that I did there on All-Star Wrestling. I'm going to put out probably in, I think, in March. Um, and recently what happened is a, uh, an author contacted me who wanted to write a book. And uh, it's a fictional book. And he wanted to reference me in it. And he's also referenced, uh, maybe you're in the baseball, Gorman Thomas. Does that ring a bell? From the uh, 70s and 80s, he was with the Brewers, the Indians, the Mariners, an old-time baseball player. Uh, he was not in the Hall of Fame. And uh, he contacted me, wanted to get my permission. Now, he could have asked anybody, you know. He could have asked anybody. But, uh, you know, I, I consider him not a fan of mine, but just a wrestling fan. I, I, I never said anybody's a fan of me. I just said they're wrestling fans. They happen to watch my site. Uh, his name is Sam, uh, Sam Martin. And uh, uh, he's going to be publishing this book at the end of this year, next couple of weeks from what he told me. And I'm going to put a piece of that up in March. So all this was become, because of my website, you know. So some really fantastic things have happened out of it. I feel like my, my career has started over again to a point, you know. And uh, I think, I think uh, you know, being placed in the WWE history books and the IWF Hall of Fame, I think it's a great cap to my career, you know. I think I'm, I'm very happy, very satisfied because of this website. I love it. And those Andre matches, that's really, really cool. What was it like working with Andre the Giant? Andre the Giant was a... Uh, uh, true professional, true professional, you know, uh, you get in the ring and, and you, tr and you trusted the guy, you had to trust him. You know what <laughs> you mean? Uh, when, when somebody as big as he is, as tall as he is, 
Uh, you, and, you, and you do what he asks you to do, too, <laughs> in the ring. Uh, but, but there really wasn't too much talk between me and him. He would do his thing, and, and I would do mine to get some heat and so where He'd make his comeback, and, and we'd go home, and, and that's pretty much it. You know, I, never, I never worked with him in, in, a, in a house show of any kind. I mean, I've worked with a lot of the guys who I, I put over on TV, you know, Pedro Morales and house shows, and, and they would give back. You know, Pat Patterson. I got a great match with Pat Patterson on my website from uh, the Nassau Coliseum, and I'm throwing Pat Patterson outside of the ring several times. But, you know, they, they, they realize, they say, well, you know, this guy did a great job for me, put me over on TV and so forth, and I'm going to give back to him, you know, and, makes, and it makes me look good, you know. So I'm, I'm, very, I'm very pleased. A lot of people I worked with, you know, they, they were very generous, as I like to say, very generous. Did you get along with Andre? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I understand, you know, he didn't like certain people, and, and, and he wasn't afraid to show it. But uh, there was a time uh, I was booked in Salisbury, Maryland, and I had gotten there a little too early. I was a civic civic arena, and I got in there early. I was the only one there. I'm in the dressing room, and I see some kid coming in with a big case of looked like champagne, you know. And I said, uh-oh, Andre's here. And sure enough, here comes Andre. Come How you doing, boss? I say, hey, Andre, how you doing? You know, I say, it looks like you got some champagne for the night, huh? Yeah, you, you want one? <laughs> I said, no, Andre, no, no, thank you. But, but hey, he's a very nice guy. You know, very nice guy. Sure. So the stories of his drinking aren't exaggerated. They are actually true. Well, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know what he was in his, his earlier years wrestling, but I, I, I think from what I had heard, the story goes, is that, you know, when he knew he was, like, slowly dying, of that gigantism disease, whatever that is. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to enjoy life the best he could, you know? Yeah. He, he was a big drinker, big drinker. And, and Arnold Skolan, uh, you know, those two, I'm sh they sure they shared many a bar stool together, you know? Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a shame. It's just that, uh, you know, his, his life was limited to, I, I don't know what age it was when he passed away to you. Early 40s, I think 43, something like that. He is very early. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe it's lucky he, he made it to 43. You know, it's a shame. But there's a lot of, but, but, but you know, there's a lot of tragedies, a lot of these guys, you know, and I read yeah. about them. I say, I say, you know, here you are, you're, you're, you've been many vendors for years and made a lot of money. I said, and you got nothing to show for, it, you know, involved with drugs alcohol. I said, what, what leads to that? You know? And, and, you know, I, I thank, I thank God that, that, that my father who, who was my hero passed away 15 so years ago, uh, who was a big investor in the stock market. He showed me how to do it. And, uh, I, you know, made a lot, I made a lot of money as like I said earlier. And, and, you know, I was able to afford a lot of things. I'm here in Florida. I'm in, I'm in my, fifth house that I built from the ground up. And it's my last house. I'm a nice two story on a half acre property. And I love collecting cars. I got some beautiful cars on my website that I just bought a new 2022 20, GT California special, a cyber orange. Mainly that's for my wife, but she lets me drive it every now and then. Nice. But uh, uh, it, it's, I, I think that's because of my father. My father taught me well. You know, and I never got involved with drugs. I, I love I love beer. I don't get drunk when I drink beer. I, I you know I enjoy it after a round of golf, maybe two beers, three beers. You know, the drugs never was in the drugs. And I said, you know, that's just going to ruin your life. It's going to ruin your life. When you look at Andre, they always say like, oh, like you were kind of saying that he didn't like some people, didn't get along with some people. I was buddies with Bundy, and he was saying that Big John Studd and Andre did get along. But then you always hear the stories of Big John Studd and Andre not getting along. So were there some guys like that that he really just – they just didn't get along? Um, you know, it, it was really hard to see uh, when you were back in the dressing room. Uh, you know, because, you know, as, as I say, the, those, those real bigger names, Hogan – Andre Savage, they were a little distant from everybody else. You, you really couldn't see that. And I'll be honest with you, during that whole time, I would have never knew that he was at odds with anybody. You know, all this has came out now because of the internet. You know, there's so much yeah. on the internet. We're, we're all learning something new today. I, when I investigate uh, research, 
my own stuff. I mean, I'm finding more stuff all the time on myself. And then I go over here and say, well, I try not to spend too much time that has anything to do with WWE. You know, I, I, you know, I gave that up. I told that story many times. I gave it up many years ago. Don't watch it. Don't care, care to see what's going on. But I'll research uh, the old names. OK. And I say, well, you know, this this is this is odd. This is strange. And I never knew this before. And, uh, you know, I'm educating myself. You know, I don't spend all day watching this, but, you know, it's part it's part of my research on my my background of myself, because, as I say, you know, I come across so much stuff, you know, and, and other other guys that I knew, too. And I take my time and I'll read about it, you know, and uh, uh, it's interesting, very interesting to me, you know. I love looking up the stuff and be like, holy shit, like 1982, you had a world title match against Bob Back and like stuff that, you, you know, you wouldn't remember. But then I was like, wow, world title match. Nice. It was it was as the executioner. OK. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I have I mean, there, there was a lot of that at that time against as the executioner. Um, some people have said, well, you had a title match against this guy. This guy said, well, no, that's, that's not correct. I did work with them. But it was not a title match. But but I did do one in a house, in a spot show uh, with with Bob Backlund, and um, um, it was just just something I was going to just mention, and it just went boom right over. It. Um, but you know, I, I think I think one of the things is that um, what I what I want to remember is that these great guys that I had an opportunity to work with, you know, and that's what my website is about. It's not about just me. It's about the great guys of yesterday. You know, I pay tribute to Pedro Morales. I pay tribute to Johnny Valiant and Bruno San Martino on there, you know. And uh, yeah, but, you know, working, you know, the, 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 a lot of the people have said, you know, hey, we know what your your biggest upset was. But let me tell you something, you know, and it's true, I, I think. And maybe maybe you can tell me different. But, John, I've got the most upsets in professional wrestling history. And I'm talking about names. OK, uh, I've beaten Iron Mike Sharp in the civic arena in Pittsburgh. And plus there was another, another spot show I beat him in. I beat Rene Goulet in Toronto's Maple Leaf Garden. Yeah. My biggest upset was over chief Jay Strongbow on Long Island, New York. I pinned his shoulders. And of course the big upset and all that's on my website. I've got parts of a lot of my matches that I've, I, I've worked. I, I couldn't get everything. But there's the results in the town that I worked in, and so forth. And um, um, you know, I've, I've got my share of upsets. People have said you've got the most upsets in pro wrestling history. People, some people, fans have said, well, uh, you know, this guy has so many upsets over these and the names I've never ever heard of. You know, well, I'm talking about guys who've been in the business for for 20, 30 years that, that I've got the upsets against. You know, I've worked against Bobo Brazil. I've, I've worked against uh, Dusty Rhodes and, 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 and so many top names in the business, you know, and, and it's like they said, when they do an interview, they said, you wrestled them all. I wrestled Johnny and Jerry Valiant in the IWF, you know? Uh, so, you know, I, a lot of fine, me fine memories, you know, working with these guys. These, these guys are the legends of yesterday. Yeah. That's a lot of respect for you. I mean, for them to do the favors, you know, do the honors for you show some good amount of respect. Exactly. Exactly. When you did the executioner, whose idea is that? Because it's almost like you're paying a little bit of homage to uh, Killer Kowalski there. Um, yeah. Um, apparently, that was Vince Seniors. Uh, when uh, he he never he never told me that that day in the dressing room. He said uh, he said Are you able to travel, and uh, I said yeah. I said I thought I was traveling anyway. I said to myself, you know, but I guess he meant maybe all over the world or all over the country. Yep. And uh, Gorilla Monsoon told me at one TV taping, he says, get the executioner's gimmick like Waller had so forth, I, which I did. And uh, that's, that's pretty much how that part started. You know, I worked, I worked for a year in 1981 and then they were going to send me out to California for Mike LaBelle. Now, I didn't know if it was going to be as executioner or Ron Shaw. I, I didn't know. And, uh, after 1981 of making so much money and everybody telling me, well, you're not going to make much money there. You know, I said, well, I had to give it some thought. And I said, I said to Monsoon, I said, you know, Gino, I'm not going to go. He said, All right. So on a tour up in upstate New York, uh, I was told to give Vince Jr. a call. 
And he said, Ron, he goes, I heard you don't want to go out to uh, California. I said, yeah. He said, well, you can make tonight your last night, you know. I said, okay. I, I guess maybe I saw that one coming, you know. And I said, I thanked him for the opportunity. And as I say, that's when I went to the IWF for almost two years, you know. Uh, but maybe that was a grooming stage, you know. I, 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 I regret uh, maybe today. At the time, I kind of didn't, you know, um, because I, I don't know – what was supposed to happen out of that? You know, I, re I really don't, because they didn't tell you much. They really didn't tell you much. All of a sudden, Hey, you're going here. All right. Why? You know, I, I didn't ask anybody why, you know, I'm, I'm green, you know? Uh, so, um, the, the, almost the two years that, that when we merged in the IWF with Bruno and everything, we were, we were working a lot of shows. I mean, I can't say that of all those shows that were sold out that were sold out, but we were guaranteed. Okay. We had some backers. So the TV was paid for by the backers and, and we were getting our guarantees. So, you know, if I went into Ohio, Canton, Ohio at the Civic Center and uh, there was only maybe about 500 people in a 10,000 seat Civic Center, you know, that's, that's not too good, you know, but we got our guarantees anyway. So that's what made it worthwhile because <laughs> I don't think I could have lasted with, with uh, small payouts, you know, right. I, when, when, you had, when you already had a taste of the money, so, you know, this was, this was getting me through, you know, this was getting me through and we see, we saw the end of it coming and uh, at such a coincidence at the time when I decided not to go up to new England to do some more IWF shows, I gave Vince a call and uh, he says, well, he goes, give my father a call. Okay. He'll, he'll let you know if, if we'll bring you back. So I had to call him in Florida and uh, he says, well, Ron, he goes, you know, the roster roster's full. We got 30 some odd guys. He goes, but you know what? He goes, come on back to the next TV. Well, I came back and it wasn't about a week or two after that. Bruno was back there already doing color commentary because, you know, during that time they were having an outing pretty much. I think, I think yeah. Bruno was so convinced and so forth back and forth, or whatever it was, but then he came to that agreement that he would do color commentating. But it's funny how we both came back at the same time, pretty much, you know, yeah, what did you think about Vince Jr.? Because that's a completely different era. I mean, we're going to the Hogan era here with, with a completely different mindset. Yeah, um, I, I didn't talk to Vince too much because um, he was always busy. Um, I, ha I have to say, you know, when I did talk to him and so forth, it was just, you know, just just, just short and sweet to the point and, and uh, you know, do your, do your, do your job and, and what you're supposed to do here and, and everything's fine. And I, I never, I never gave him no problem. Never gave him a problem. I mean, he was a totally different guy to deal with. I mean, you, you could tell he had an attitude. <laughs> he was getting an attitude, you know, and uh, when his father passed away, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess he was just a different, different guy. He was going to run, run things his way and, and it was going to be that way. And, and, and look, you see what's happened today. I mean, what, what he made the business. I mean, it's not something I agree, agree about, you know, but it's, it's now entertainment, you know, but, but this guy, I have to tell I have to tell you this. This guy was the greatest promoter in the world. He could make a hard boiled egg, the world champion, and make the people buy it. That's how good he was. Yeah, no doubt about it. Yes. The greatest promoter of all time. For sure. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. What do you think is some similarities and some differences with him and his dad? Because so many people said they were so much different. His dad is so honest and he wasn't as forthright with some people. Like what what's the similarities and differences with him and his dad? Well, well, you know, what I could see was that, uh, uh, you know, of course, you had to be a, one of the top guys to understand the difference, really understand the difference. But what I had saw is that, you know, Ben Sr. was just a very calm guy who, who, who took the business, you know, seriously and, and where it was and so forth. And, and, and Vince was a little bit more of a brash, more of the attitude and probably showed it and wasn't afraid to show it. And, you know, but, but as I say, you know, you had to be a top name to really deal with the guy. I mean, you know, when you were like King Kong Bundy and calling Vince Sr. up at home or Vince Jr. up at home and saying, hey, look, this ain't going to work between me and Hogan, blah, 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 blah. And so forth. Again, this is a story that, you know, Chris, Chris told me a couple of times, you know, when he was when he was working the Bundy gimmick and so forth. I said, man, I said, that took a lot of balls for you to do that, you know. And, but I guess, I guess he could do it. You know, if you're going to if you're going to meet Hogan for a championship all around the territory, I guess you uh, he has some ideas that he wants to throw at him. So, you know, you know, that those guys knew pretty much. I didn't see. 
But the, the, the difference between the two of them was is that one was so calm and the other one was more, I guess, energetic to do, you know, and do what he was going to do. And nobody was going to stop him either. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It just was one of the things. It, be, it became a global uh, phenomenon. It wasn't just a Northeast regional thing anymore. It was global. It was worldwide. Exactly. Yeah. And, and how can you how can you survive? I mean, yeah, well, there, there's the uh, uh, couple companies that are out there now. I, I, you know, I don't pay attention to them. I don't know if they're they're making money or what. I don't know. You know, you you probably know that better than I. Um, but apparently they're they're surviving. They've been there for for four, five, six years, I guess. You know, they're surviving. And and uh, Vince, I don't think Vince is trying to do anything about them. You know, I think he gets his he gets his guaranteed revenue from what I've read from uh, all his cable. So he's well taken care of. He books all these house shows like here in Fort Myers at the, at our uh, Germain Arena. Uh, he's got it booked for the next eight, nine years. Uh, and as long as nobody comes in there. And from what I've heard from fans is that, you know, there might be about maybe uh 2,000, 2,500 people in a 7,000, you know, uh, seat arena, you know, because, you know, there's, there's so much of this cable on TV that you can watch for free. I mean, why would you want to spend what, what's, what's the cheapest seat in one of these houses? 50, 70, 100 bucks? I don't know, <laughs> you know, and especially in today's, today's economy where everything is almost triple. Yep. You know, it's it's tough to fill those seats, but I think the, well, the reason I guess he does that is that you know he guarantees there's no other company that's going to come in there, so he's got them all locked up. And that's that's from what I've read. So when you look at it, like you mentioned before, the upset is something that a lot of people bring bring up to you. Uh, November twenty second, nineteen eighty five, believe it or not, all the way back nineteen eighty five, on the Prism Network. So it's available on TV in Philly. It's it, you know they're filming it for TV. You beat David San Martino. What happened with this upset? Because it seemed like, hey, it's Bruno's kid, David San Martino. He's he's not losing here. I mean, it's a TV match. And what? So what really happened here? Was he even supposed to lose? Like, so what happened with David San Martino? Well, John, let me let me tell you something. You know, uh, uh, David may tell the story, and he has in other uh, uh, wrestling uh, um, blogs and so forth that, well, you know, I, I defeated him so many times on TV before that. Well, that's just not true, okay? The first time we ever met was on uh, Poughkeepsie taping when he first came into territory. And uh, uh, we did a hold-for-hold hold match. Uh I slammed him one time really good and he picked me up and uh, gorilla pressed me and pinned me. And, and that was the very first time that we met. So, so he, you know, when he wrote about some things or, or spoke about some things and there were some untruths in there. Okay. Uh, coming down to that night, that was probably the second, that was the second time that I was going to work with him. And it was a sold out, sold out spectrum. And I said, probably, I think it was about another, 30, 40,000 people on cable that night on the Prism Network, okay? And uh, from, you know, as I say, you know, you can, you can hear his opinion of what happened that night, and then there's my opinion of what happened that night. But when I was down there, Hogan came up to me, and he says, hey, man, something's going to go down with David tonight, you know? And I said, okay. And then Bobby Heenan comes back to me and almost tells me the same thing. I was like as if he's going to make an example of me in the ring. I, I didn't know how to take it. Well, we went out there and uh, as I say, you know, you can read all the comments you want on this. I mean, there, there could be comments of 100,000 uh, views on, on, on different uh, search engines of this match because it's all over. It's all over. And a lot of people uh, – believe in what he said. A lot of people are believing what I said. I said, you know, I went out there and if you take a look at his first two smashes behind his head, uh, there was no pulled punches there. I'm just going to tell you that right there. Uh, and that match went on the way it was. Uh, he did say in an interview on the Monty and Farrow show that I was the better man that night. I did hurt his back and I, I pretty much kind of retired him that night. I, I understand that he didn't even take a shower. He went right back in his car with his wife, and they went right back to Atlanta. And that's the last they heard of him. You know. 
But uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're still. I mean, still, this thing is still fresh today, John. I mean, I mean, people are still, you know, talking about it, you know, and it's it's amazing, you know. I, I never thought of anything about it until the internet was born, <laughs> you know, and and it, it's crazy. It's really crazy. Yeah, definitely a surprise. So you kind of took it as he was trying to maybe take some liberties with you, and, and you you know defending yourself kind of thing. That that's 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 the way I kind of took it. And and sometimes you have to uh, do something before the other person does. You know, I, I I had experiences before with this, especially I think it was the first my first year in IWF out in Pittsburgh. It was a football player who was trained. And uh, he was pretty, pretty well put together, but he was my height and so forth. And we're working out there in the ring and, and he's not selling. And you know, I, I'm trying to wise him up real quick. I said, you know, you're making me look like an asshole here. You know, and we're not having a match, you know. And we lock up again. We're doing things. He's, he's not doing what he's supposed to do. I got pissed off. I put him in a reverse arm bar. I drove him right down to the mat and I hyperextended. And, and I know I did some damage to his elbow or his shoulder, okay, because he couldn't work anymore. He, he left the ring right away. And uh, there's even a writing that I've got that people wrote about. He said, you know, don't mess with certain guys like Ron Shaw, uh, um, uh, Charlie Fulton. They, you know, they, they got tempers. They may not show up, but they got tempers. And I did have a temper. You know, I know I got a temper today. You know, I, 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 I've got nothing to – to take it out on anybody. I just, I knew I had a temper back then, you know, but I didn't want to get in any battles with anybody. I was, I was in a shoot with uh, me and Davey O'Hannon. No, me and a, and a young guy who uh, uh, used to sit around ringside now in town with his mom and give out roses to the wrestlers, to the baby faces. It was a young, young guy. And I come to the show and I see him. He goes, Hey Ron, you remember me? I said, yeah. I said, you used to be with your mom. We used to be, I think, the flower lady, rose, rose lady, whatever it was. And here he is. I'm working. Uh, he's working with me in a tag team against, uh, I think it was uh, Sika and uh, the nephew. I forget the nephew's name. Uh, Sam, Sam. Not Sam, Tonga, Tonga Kid? Tonga Kid. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. And uh, he must have said something in the dressing room. Davey O'Hannon comes up to me and says, hey, Ron. He goes, just go with it. Just go with it. I said, I said, I don't know what the hell that means. You know, I'm, I said, I'm not, I wasn't being part of this thing, but he said something in the dressing room and all of a sudden they start beating the shit out of him. I mean, they were jumping off the top rope. He was spitting out blood at the end. I, I never even had a chance to tag out with him, you know, they just mopped him up real quick, pinned him. And that was it. That was his first match and his last match. I know that for a fact. Wow. He, he just, he got so injured, you know, and uh, yeah. I know I know if I would have tagged out there, which they weren't going to let him do that. He, he wanted to tag out with me and so forth. And I said, oh, I said, I know what this is about. And I said, the poor kid, I don't know. I don't know. Still to this day, I don't know what he said, but he had to mouth off in the dressing room, you know, say, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. You don't do that. You know, your first day or whatever it is, you just shut up and listen. And, and it's, it's really a shame. But it's, that's that's the business. You know, it's the business. People people say this business is fake. It's not. It's predetermined. Yeah. But, you know, and I, and I take offense to saying, you know, that they say we're actors, you know, I, I don't look at myself as an actor and never did. You know, every, everything was contact. You know, I laid in punches. I did this. I had to stiff a few. If I got stiffed a few, you got stiffed a few. So, right. that, you know, it wasn't fake. That, that term, that term is, is actually insulting. You know, that, that's just, you know, that's the term they used to use back in the days, like jobber. You know, that, that's that's what the fans uh, terminology is. We never use that in the dressing room. Nobody ever heard that. You know, if if Monsoon came up to me and, and some kid and says, hey, we're going to we're going to we're going to put Ron over tonight. You know, we put we're gonna put Ron over. tonight. He doesn't say you're going to do a job for Ron tonight. See what I mean? Right. So, right. you know, the terminology, that, that's all the fans terminology. And, and I don't take offense to it. You know, there, there's out there Ron, Ron Shaw jobber taking on that don't that don't offense me you know don't bother me one bit there's there's smart there's 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 smart fans good fans out there and then there's the ones that need to be enlightened a little bit more you know they 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 still think part 
part of it is real and, and, and you know, and, and I, and I get some of it sometimes, you know, I mean, so even today's stuff that's been so pushed as entertainment, you know, they got stuff on the, on, on the, uh, uh, on, on the, on the computer where they're going, they're practicing a, uh, uh, what, what they're going to do during the match. And there, somebody took video of it and they were two pretty big names. I forget who they were. And, uh, they put it on the internet and so forth. Well, who cares? You know, everybody knows it's a work now, you know? Yeah. So why did you end up leaving WWF when, when you did? Like, were you just done with wrestling? Were you done with the business? Like, what was the thought process behind leaving? Um, I, I have to say, you know, first of all, in 1980, when I came back in early 1984, 1st of January in 1984, I was working, getting booked like crazy, 85, like crazy. 86, they brought in George Scott, and he brought up a couple of his guys. So then I saw my bookings drop. So, you know, I first started saying, well, you know, I'm not going to be driving all the way up to Poughkeepsie. I'm not going to fly up to uh, 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 Canada to do the other taping, you know, even though they paid your airfare and so forth. I, I just, that's just not worth it to me, you know. I said, if, if I drop down from five bookings a week down to maybe two, that, 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 you know, that's not too good for me. So, uh, in 86, Rick Martel was leaving, going back up to uh, Dino Bravo up in Montreal. He said, Ron, he goes, why don't you come on up? I said, yeah, I said, maybe my bookings will come back. But then two weeks later, we talked again. He goes, look, I'll fly you up. He goes, we'll, we'll do TV and, and you'll get a couple of house shows around it. He goes, just let me know what your bookings are with Vince. I know you don't want to lose them. And uh, so I, I, not only was I doing it, and he was doing this every, about every two weeks. So I was getting an additional eight Eight, eight, nine, ten shows out of him, and then I was also getting work with Crockett because I did some shows with them earlier, and I gave him a call, and they said, "Well, yeah, you, you know, come on down to Baltimore in Virginia. It's nothing. You, you don't have to do no TV, nothing like that." And they were just trying to help me out because I was always there. You know, if you called on me, I went. Right. So they were helping me out. So I was working. Eighty six was a busy, busy year. Uh, probably the most travel that I've ever done. But you know, I made less money because I wasn't working with Vince. So came back in 87, they started booking me again. 88 started to go downhill and they, they were like eliminating guys like, like me, Fulton and using guys like SD Jones and, and Mike Sharps, those type of guys to put over the bigger stars. See what I mean? Right. So, yep. so those bigger names are now we're putting over new bigger names. And so my book, started dropping. And then this, I, uh, NWF opened up the same year. So that's I went with them for two years. So that's when we uh, we we did the executioners gimmick, me and AJ Petruzzi, and uh, I've got those matches also on my website too. So uh, 1990 <clears throat> came around. I opened up a wrestling school with Larry Winters, uh, and then we merged with uh, a Joel Goodhart. I don't know if you know him. Yeah, TWA. Right? TWA, exactly. And uh, they were using me pretty much as a manager type of a thing. And I didn't really care for that too much. I, I did do a big, a big show at the Philadelphia civic center there where I was a guest referee between the Sandman, who was one of the guys I trained me and Larry winters trained and, uh, and a young guy, uh, forget his name. Where I was a guest referee and, uh, uh, we did something there at the finish. Uh, as, as I say, that's on my website. We did something at the finish where the fans started bombarding me with trash I got out of the damn damn ring, ran back, and somebody yelled out, man, Shaw, I'm going to stab you tonight. And I created so much heat in that match. Yeah, I mean, you have, you have to go see that. And uh, But uh, I, I just didn't, you know, I wanted to be back in the ring work, uh, wrestling. So I started thinking about it, and I, I gave Walter Kowalski a call, and I said, Walter, I said, you know, I'm thinking about getting out of the business. You know, I said, this is this way, and this is going on. And he goes, he goes, how's your, uh, uh, your passport? I said, oh, it's up to date. He goes, he goes, I'll give your name to somebody. Are you able to travel? I said, yeah. So, uh, I think primarily most of the nineties, you know, like the first week of each month I was, uh, I got booked overseas, you know, uh, was to a lot of places, a lot of different countries. And, uh, I was still working for some promotions, just not the TWA to fill it in. So you know, I worked 20 years, never had to, have a, a part-time job, you know, I made a living and, and just at the end of 1999, I said, well, that's it. I think I'm done. I wanted to move down here to Florida. And that's what I decided to do. And I said, you know, when I, when I decide to do something, I do it, you know? 
and and it was it was it was the right. I took two years off completely, and I had a friend down here that I met. And he says, "Hey, he goes, you know, drive a truck, you know, like you know, haul U.S. mail. It's great money and so forth." I said, "Okay." So you know, I had a CDL, which was many many years ago. I had a CDL back in Pennsylvania because I was working in construction with my father prior to wrestling and and uh, driving a truck a little bit. So uh, we just had to get we got a Florida CDL license and so forth and. Went right to work with them, you know, and uh, so I, re I retired. Uh, good. I'm, I'm 65 years old now, John, and uh, I think I retired about 10, 11 years ago. And so I'm just enjoying playing golf at the pool. I got my own gym here at the house. I work out and uh, I'm just enjoying life. Fortunately, I'm healthy. I'm only 235 pounds, <laughs> so, but, you know. I'm older. I'm, I'm, I'm glad not to have that 270 pounds anymore. Yeah, there you go. So as we hit the wind end here, we head towards the finish. How do you think you're going to be remembered? Like, what's the stamp of Big Ron Show? Would it be all the upsets? I mean, Chief J. Strombo, Rene Goulet, David San Martino. Is that how? Iron Mike Sharp. Is that how you're going to be remembered? Like, what do you think uh, the stamp is going to be? The legacy of Big you, Ron? You, 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 you hit it right on the nail, pretty much. I mean, I mean, if the WWE put me in her two history books of pro wrestling for, for that reason, the big upset and people still talking about it today. If they're still talking, talking about it today, I'm sure another 10, 15, 20 years, they'll still be talking about it. Yes. You know? So I, I guess, I guess that's what I did. I said, you know, I, I thank all you guys who have called me to do these interviews. As I said, you know, I was just a little guy in this business, John, but a lot of interesting things happened to me along the way that put me on the map. Planned. Most of them were planned, you know, yeah. and that's what happened to me. And and I guess I'm thankful for it. I lived out my dream, you know, at eight years old doing what I did. It it probably, you know, as I say, if I if I if I had gone out to California, maybe it would have been different. Maybe it wouldn't have been different. Who knows, you know? But I did it. It's it's times over with, and and that's it. I'm I'm having fun with my website. I'm joining the people's comments and and. Uh, I think that just keeps me going, and that's about as much as I want to do with the business anymore. Again, give us one last push where everybody can find you and find the website. That's all over the place. It's it's Big Ron Shaw, WWF com, and uh, you can see everything you need to see on there about my career. And as I say, it's not only just about me. It's about those great, great talents that I've worked with all those other years. Yeah, we'll never forget that era either, man. That's those were the days when professional wrestling was professional wrestling. The golden era, if you will, for sure. Exactly. So, Big Ron, thank you so much for all the time. Really appreciate it, John. I want to thank you, and 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 I'm glad I'm glad I was decided to do this show because you know, as I say, with the with the big names that you had on there, I I needed to be on this show for at least an hour, and you were very generous to me today. Thank you. Yes, no problem. And you will be added to that list with those names, just like you always were. So thank you Great. for coming on. I appreciate it. All right, my friend.